Assalamu alaikum students. Welcome back to ENG 552. This is your American literature class and in this class we have covered a number of genres. We've done essays, we've done uh, a chapter from a novel, we did short stories, poems and currently we're doing Tennessee Williams's uh, play The Glass Menagerie. Uh, Williams calls it a memory play and he says that as such it doesn't have to be realistic uh, which means that um, the playwright or the dramatist can uh, bring in uh, bring into play his imagination or how he conceives of a particular um, individual or object or place so uh, being a memory play um, it has uh, four uh, main characters. You have the character of Amanda Wingfield um, or Mrs. Wingfield as um, we refer to her here and then you have um, her daughter Laura Wingfield, her son Tom Wingfield and one character who comes towards the end of the play and whom Williams calls the gentleman caller. I have explained um, to you um, the concept of the gentleman caller and I'm sure you remember that um, I told you that this is the kind of uh, character who uh, is introduced to, in order to um, create an atmosphere um, linked to the institution of marriage. And a gentleman caller would traditionally call upon um, a lady uh, in her house or in her place of residence at specific times uh, with the intention of uh, marrying the, the, the lady in question. So uh, the concept of the gentleman caller, although a little old-fashioned, is still used by Tennessee Williams in this contemporary play uh, because the, the kind of um, culture and society that Williams is portraying um, demands that there be a gentleman caller. Uh, also, uh, Amanda Wingfield refers to this character as the gentleman caller because um, she is also living in the past and um, she thinks about her own youth before she got married uh, and she remembers that in those days there were gentlemen callers. So strictly speaking at the time that Williams was writing um, the concept of the gentleman caller had died out but because this is basically a memory play and it is as much Amanda Wingfield's uh, memory as Tom Wingfield's memory which comes into play in this um, drama. So uh, Amanda Wingfield remembers her gentleman callers uh, before she decided to marry um, Tom and Laura's father. So um, she keeps on referring to the time which is um, you know about 30 years in the past. So 30 years in the past for uh, Amanda, um, she lives in the past, she lives in that time before she got married and before she had the responsibility of running a household uh, with the addition of doing it alone. Um, since Mr. Wingfield um, just disappears from the scene one fine day and the family doesn't know where he is, what he's doing and even whether he's alive. Uh, one reason why Williams calls it a memory play is because um, at the very beginning of the play he shows you the narrator of the play and that is Tom Wingfield. Tom Wingfield enters as the narrator and goes on to take part in the action of the play and then um, he goes back to being a narrator so um, the, the role of Tom Wingfield um, has uh, double the importance of any other character because he's not only an actor or a character within the play but he's also the narrator uh, and as narrator he's looking back into the past recalling incidents um, recalling individuals and um, the moment at which the play starts you find Tom in the middle of 
um, the action as you would call it. So um, this is of course lower middle class household being lower middle class um, there are pretensions to uh, middle class and upper middle class but it's very difficult to get into those classes not only because of the stiff competition but also because the financial circumstances of the wing fields um, do not allow them <coughs> to consider themselves to be in the middle class let alone the upper middle class Tom Wingfield um, works very hard, so does Amanda Wingfield. Tom Wingfield is working in a um, shoe warehouse and uh, Amanda Wingfield tries to supplement whatever income Tom uh, has uh, with um, subscriptions to uh, women's magazines and women's journals, etc., etc. Laura Wingfield does not do anything. Um, Laura has a slight disability which does not allow her to walk fast or to walk straight. So she walks with a limp, she walks slowly uh, and because um, Mrs. Uh, Wingfield considers that uh, Laura does not have the chance uh, to move in society, uh, therefore she uh, plans to um, have Laura in the job market once she has finished doing her secretarial course and then all of a sudden she discovers that Amanda um, has not been um, getting her secretarial training and that she's just been walking around town uh, not having the courage to tell her mother and not wanting to go back to the secretarial school after uh, she throws up in front of everyone else. So it's, it's a tricky um, situation in which you have ge a gentleman caller coming at the end. And uh, the fifth character um, and one who is very, very important in the play, in spite of the fact that he doesn't make a physical appearance, that character is that of Mr. Wingfield. Now when the play um, opens uh, or when the curtain rises, uh, Mr. Wingfield's portrait is seen to be hanging on the wall in a very prominent place um, as if to say I'm here and yet you do not find him anywhere in the play. He's not even like the gentleman caller who comes towards the end of the play. He doesn't physically appear and yet um, the, cha the tangibility of his presence cannot be questioned. So um, these are the five um, characters of the play and these are the characters around whom the, all the action um, revolves. Uh, we had left off at a point in time when Tom Wingfield and his mother are having an argument over um, the kind of life that Tom is leading and according to Mrs. Wingfield um, Tom uh, disappears in the night he doesn't come back till um, early morning and then he just gets a few hours of sleep and he has to go back to work um, and um, she um, suspects that he is um, involved in some sort of uh, nefarious activities uh, and when she uh, indirectly accuses Tom, Tom gets very angry and he just sort of um, explodes uh, and during his uh, conversation with uh, his mother, he's shouting at the top of his voice, Amanda Wingfield is shouting, uh, she questions his, um, his uh, obedience and his loyalty to the family and he is very angry because he says I work um, very hard and I bring all the money to you and all I hear is complain 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 so um, he gets very angry and um, there's a regular shouting match um, and at the climax of which Tom um, decides to leave and uh, his his arm gets stuck in his coat sleeve, he tears it off uh, and um, he just uh, rushes um, out of the door and of course Mrs. Fingfield is very very upset, so is Laura 
but Mrs. Wingfield will not keep quiet. So the point at which we left off in the last lecture was where Tom had just called his mother a witch and um, she finds it very difficult to digest that. She's very angry with him but she's upset also because um, she um, thinks that he is cruel, he has been unkind to her by labeling her a witch even though all that she is concerned with is the welfare of the family, the welfare of um, her children. So let's see what we have for today. The legend on the screen says the glass menagerie uh, and you remember um, Tom at the end of the last um, scene had just flung his coat into the room and uh, when he did so the coat had struck this glass cabinet where Laura keeps all those animals and she cries out as if she has been wounded um, and of course um, Tom has not done it intentionally and uh, Laura cries out and she says my glass menagerie you know it's like she herself has been wounded it's not glass animals that have been wounded or it's not a glass cabinet that's been uh, harmed but her physical or her spiritual um, self while all this is going on Amanda is struck dumb she doesn't um, react because she is so overcome by the fact that her um, son has called her ugly witch that um, she for for some time she cannot speak and when she does recover her speech she says I won't speak to you until you apologize so she crosses through the curtains she goes back um, and Tom is left with Laura. Laura clings weakly to the mantle with, uh, with her face averted uh, and Tom doesn't know what to do. Tom just stares stupidly. You know he has done something. He has called his mother an ugly witch. He has thrown his coat at uh, Laura's glass menagerie. So in one go he has hurt both his mother and his sister and now he doesn't know what to do because his mother leaves his uh, presence um, his sister stands with her face on the side as if she doesn't want to see him and Tom doesn't know what to do he crosses to the shelf he um, bends down and collects the fallen glass um, he wants to speak to Laura but he can't because he realizes that he has uh, he has actually hurt her. He has not uh, harmed the collection so much as his sister because this collection is uh, Laura's heart and soul. It is her life and she dusts it and polishes it and washes it almost as if um, you would do to your baby, to your offspring. So um, the, um, the, this, the music is very soft and uh, the legend on the screen says the glass menagerie and we, when, when this um, scene is played out we see Laura standing on one side leaning against the mantle almost as if she's going to collapse and um, Tom is in a kneeling position trying to collect the bits of uh, broken glass he wants to say sorry to Laura he wants to apologize uh, but he can't find the words to do so and with that the scene comes to an end when scene 4 starts the interior is dark and there is a little light in the alley a deep voiced bell in a church is tolling the hour of 5 as the scene commences so it is 5 o'clock in the morning Tom appears at the top of the alley after each solemn boom of the bell in the tower he shakes a little noise maker or rattle as if to express the tiny spasm of man in contrast to the sustained power and dignity of the Almighty this and the unsteadiness of his advance make it evident that he has been drinking 
So um, the, the scene uh, prior to this, that is the, the third scene, that comes to an end. And the fourth scene starts uh, immediately afterwards, but the time that is given is that of 5 o'clock in the morning. And during this time, presumably, Tom has gone out and now he is returning. So 5 o'clock in the morning, he is coming back home. As he climbs the steps um, to the fire escape landing, um, there's a little light inside. Laura appears in her night dress. Uh, and she sees that Tom's bed is empty. When she sees that, uh, on the other side, you see Tom um, searching for his door key in, uh, in the pocket. Uh, he takes out a number of uh, articles. Williams calls it a motley of articles, um, including an empty bottle. And the impression is that it is empty because um, Tom has ingested all uh, the contents. He finds the key, uh, but just as he's about to insert it, it slips from his fingers uh, and um, it falls into the drain. So he strikes a match, he crouches below the door, uh, but he realizes that the key has fallen through a crack in um, the floor. Now just at this time, Laura opens the door and she asks him uh, what he's doing because, you know, he's crouched down uh, and she doesn't see any reason why that should be so. According to her, he has his key and so he should just have opened the door. He do she doesn't know that he has lost the key. So um, Tom explains to her and Laura says, okay, come in, I've opened the door now, so you might as well uh, come in. It's early morning, you should not have been out all night. Laura wants to know where Tom has been and Tom says, I've been to the movies. Now, like Mrs. Wingfield, Laura also finds it difficult to believe um, that he has spent the whole night at the movies. So Tom gives her a sort of an explanation and he says it was a very long program. There was a Garbo picture and a Mickey Mouse and a travelogue and a newsreel and a preview of coming attractions. And there was an organ solo and a collection for the milk fund um, simultaneously which ended up in a terrible fight between a fat lady and an usher. So you realize that he's giving her all the details. He doesn't want to give these details to Amanda. But as far as his sister is concerned, he has a very soft spot. And um, when she asks him, um, he um, realizes that she's concerned for him. She cares for him. And so he gives her a very um, comprehensive explanation. And he says, you know, it was a very long program. It wasn't just one film. There was a cartoon also, and there was a travelogue. There was a documentary. And then... Um, random people started making uh, collections. Um, so when they were taking up collections, he said that a fight broke out between an usher and a very fat lady. Ushers, you know, are those people uh, who take you to your seat in the cinema, uh, who uh, are a part of the administration, so to speak. So when uh, Laura asks him where he has been, he gives a very complete and a very comprehensive uh, explanation. And Laura, because she's innocent and because she's concerned for her brother, she says, did you have to stay the whole time? And Tom says, oh yes, I had to. There was a big stage show. The headliner on this stage show was Malvolio the Magician. So you realize that he's giving her a very complete explanation. So when Laura asks him, Tom gives her a very complete explanation and he says, you know, this is what um, there was at um, the cinema. Uh, and he says that, you know, this was followed by again uh, a stage show and you had the magician and uh, he was performing various tricks, etc, etc. So you need to contrast this bit of explanation with what he says to Amanda Wingfield. There he just says, I'm going to the movies. He doesn't offer any explanation whatsoever. Uh, but as far as Laura is concerned, he gives her a complete 
explanation. It's a, uh, it's a comprehensive narrative. He tells her about the film, the documentary, um, the travelogue, and then they say, he says, you know, there was this show, and there was a magician, and he was turning one thing into another, um, wine to beer, beer to whiskey, uh, and back again to milk. So it was very, very uh, interesting, and I didn't want to leave um, the cinema hall uh, during the performance and so I sat throughout um, so um, he says you know the magician even gave me this scarf and um, he uh, takes it out and he shows it to Laura and in fact he offers it to Laura and he says you can have it Laura you wave it over a canary cage and you get a bowl of goldfish now um, Tom although um, he has been working for a number of years is still naive enough and innocent enough to believe that it is the scarf that performs all the magic. He doesn't realize that these are all tricks of the hand. He says this is a magic scarf and if you wave it over uh, the cage of a canary, uh, you'll get a bowl of goldfish. Of course, no such thing uh, ever happens. Uh, but he says the wonderfulest trick of all was the coffin trick uh, in which Malvolio the magician is nailed into a coffin and he gets out of the coffin without removing a single nail. And during this conversation you realize that Tom has come inside in spite of the fact that he did not have um, the key. Uh, and so, you know, the brother and sister, they're discussing things that are of mutual interest. Uh, and uh, when Tom comes in, Laura says, shh. And uh, Tom says, what are you shushing me for? And um, to which Laura says, you'll wake up mother. Now you realize that um, the brother and sister have been having this conversation and they don't want the mother to wake up because the mother is going to kick up a fuss. She's going to say, oh, you've been out all night and it's five o'clock in the morning and what have you been doing all this time? Whereas Laura expresses her concern and because they are siblings and, uh, and they are very close to each other, Tom does not think it strange to offer her explanation of his behavior, something which he will not do to um, his mother. So uh, when Laura says that, you know, um, if you make a lot of noise, you'll wake up mother, um, Tom, because he's drunk and because he's still angry from the um, shouting contest that, they, uh, that he had earlier with his mother, he says, goody, goody, pay her back for all those rise and shines. You, now you realize that Tom doesn't like to be woken up early in the morning. He hates going to uh, the warehouse, the shoe place where he works. Uh, and the fact that his mother comes to wake him up every morning, um, he resents that. And so he says, if I wake her up now, it will pay back for all those mornings when she has come to me uh, to wake me up. And uh, you might say it's a little ungrateful of Tom, but that's what he is like. So um, he says, uh, you know, he's still fascinated with the, uh, with the magic show um, that he has just witnessed. And he keeps on thinking about that. He uh, does not think about um, the present world. He doesn't think about the real world. So you realize that Tom to a great extent is living in a world of his own um, and for him the present world um, is too dull, too dreary, uh, too painful to be lived in whereas the world of the cinema, the world of the theater and um, stage performances is something that he can totally relate to because they take him away from um, his uh, dull, drab, routine life. Um, and um, just at this time when they are uh, having this uh, conversation, um, the portrait of the father lights up. The scene dims out and um, just at that uh, moment the church bell strikes six. So the idea that you get is between the time when you see Tom coming up the alley 
and um, the this moment where they're having their conversation one hour has elapsed um, at the sixth uh, strike the alarm clock goes off in Amanda's room and um, after a few moments we hear her calling rise and shine the one that uh, Tom detests um, so um, instead of going herself this time she says Laura go and tell your brother to rise and shine and Tom says I'll rise but I won't shine he um, so he has uh, gone to bed but it's just a short interval between the time when he enters and the time that the clock strikes six but during this time um, he has gone off to sleep and uh, when the church bell strikes six the alarm clock goes off and automatically almost like an alarm clock um, he hears Amanda Wingfield saying uh, Laura go and tell your brother to rise and shine um, so what Williams is doing is he's showing the passing of time and um, when Mrs. Wingfield um, calls out to Laura and tells her to go and uh, wake her brother up um, you realize that she's still angry with him if she were not she would have gone and woken him up again um, but because she's angry uh, at the uh, quarrel that they have had in the previous evening she doesn't get up herself because um, she had told him that I will not talk to you until and unless you apologize for what you have said and for your behavior so uh, she communicates through Laura she like she says Amanda go uh, sorry Laura go and tell your brother that his coffee is ready and Laura goes and she wakes up um, Tom and she says please don't make a fuss get up and go and talk to mother she's upset she's angry uh, but you need to make it up to her now you realize that Laura is in the position um, of a dependent both ways she depends on her mother and she depends on uh, her brother and so she she's also a peacemaker she doesn't want them quarreling she doesn't want them shouting at each other so um, she says you know you you better go and apologize because you were rude to her uh, and um, you need to speak to her and Tom says she won't to me it's her that started it so he wants her to apologize she wants him to apologize and there is this um, confusion here in the middle of everything you have Laura Wingfield trying to pacify both sides not having the courage to defy her mother not wanting to upset her brother so she says you know if you just say you're sorry she'll start speaking what Tom is upset with is um, that Amanda told him that she won't speak to him what Amanda resents is the fact that he has called her an ugly witch uh, amongst other things so she's very very upset she's very very angry and she says I will not speak to you so Tom, um, Tom and Amanda are on opposite sides and Laura's in the middle trying to pacify both sides and get them to forget about the quarrel so um, Amanda calls out from the kitchenette and she says uh, Laura are you going to uh, do what I asked you to do or do I have to get dressed and go out myself so um, you know poor Laura is stuck in the middle not knowing what to do wanting to pacify both sides and not really succeeding um, when um, Tom does listen to her Amanda gets angry with her she's actually angry with Tom but because she can't take it out on Tom she takes it out on Laura and Laura says you know I'm going now Amanda has asked her to get some things and um, Laura wants to make sure that her brother is awake and that her brother goes and apologizes to the mother 
So um, she um, she's trying to pacify Tom, and um, she's also trying to um, to do what her mother wants um, her to do, uh, and that is to buy butter. And um, you know, she says, "Okay, okay, I'm going." And um, the um, the 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 thing that is important here is that Amanda says, you know, um, get the butter and tell him to charge it. And Laura says, you know, when, whenever I get something on credit, uh, the shopkeepers make a face because they know um, the condition of uh, the wing fields and nobody is willing to give them credit. Uh, but uh, Amanda, where, where it it's a matter of getting credit. She will not go herself, but she will send her daughter. Um, and the daughter is stuck both ways. She is a misfit in society. She is a misfit in the household. Um, uh, and um, and she, can do, uh, she can do nothing to alleviate her uh, position either way. She can't do anything about the family. Uh, she can't do anything about society. So when uh, Laura says that, um, you know, when, when I ask for something on credit or when I buy something on credit, the shopkeepers make faces and Amanda says, sticks and stones can break our bones, but the expression on Mr. Garfinkel's face won't harm us. So let him make faces um, and uh, it will not make any difference to us. Um, so even when um, Laura is going out, she uh, she tells Tom to go and apologize to um, his mother, and uh, Amanda um, sees Laura standing there talking to her brother, uh, and she gets very angry because she doesn't want Laura interfering. She also wants uh, Tom to apologize to her, uh, but um, it's like a battle of wills between um, the two of them. So um, Laura goes out of the door and um, when um, Tom opens um, the door, um, it is because Laura has slipped and he hears a cry and, and here's the thing, Tom is very close to Laura. Perhaps the, the individual he is closest to is Laura. And so when Laura goes out the door and she slips, um, Tom hears a cry and at once he's at the door and he calls out to her uh, what happened and she says, you know, it's all right, I slipped, but I'm all right. And you realize that Laura is trying to make light of her um, situation. Um, now, um, the point is that um, the entrance and the exit from the house is through the fire escape. And the fire escape um, is very slippery. So when Laura goes out, she slips a little and Amanda gets very angry and she says, you know, if somebody breaks a leg on these fire escape steps, the landlord should be sued for every penny that he possesses or every cent as she uh, says that he um, possesses but the thing is that they have this apartment because it is cheap and so with these cheap apartments the landlords are not really willing to um, to do the maintenance and repairs as and when they are um, needed they do it when it becomes really really hazardous so um, the situation right now is that you have Amanda and Tom in the house, uh, Laura's outside, but um, neither is talking to the other. So um, in this situation where Laura has just gone out of the house, um, Tom enters um, the kitchenette uh, area for his coffee. Now the situation is very tense um, and the two characters are also tense. Tom wants to apologize to his mother uh, but cannot find the words. Amanda 
wants to forgive her son and yet she feels that because she has uttered those words she should not be the one to back down so she um, she maintains a very rigid exterior whereas inside she is very confused um, and she 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 just wants to um, speak to Tom but because she's made this declaration she will not break uh, her word and she's waiting for Tom to apologize in the meanwhile Tom um, sits down at the table and uh, starts to drink his coffee but the coffee is so scalding hot that um, he cannot swallow it and he spits it back in the cup now when he does that Amanda half turns because you know she wants to say something and yet even in that anger um, even in that emotional state she remembers what she had said uh, and you know she stops herself from uh, speaking Tom uh, meanwhile gathers his courage and clears his throat so you know it's it, it's a very formal and a very um, tense situation um, the mother and the son want to communicate but cannot because of what they have uttered earlier so um, Tom watches his mother and um, after some time he gathers sufficient courage and uh, he apologizes and says you know mother I apologize um, for what I said and I I'm sorry I didn't mean it now that is all that Amanda needs and she just sort of breaks down and she sobs and she says you know my devotion has made me a witch I have spent my whole life looking after you and I stay awake nights uh, I can't sleep I'm so confused uh, because uh, we cannot make both ends meet we are poor she doesn't say so but everything that she says um, is an expression of um, this feeling of inadequacy that she has this feeling that uh, they do not have any money um, apart from what um, Tom earns and she says you know I've had to put up a solitary battle all these years but you're my right hand tower don't fall down so she becomes emotional and um, Tom also softens and he says that um, you know I'm, I, I try uh, not to fail you and Amanda says you know if you try you can succeed and you can um, you, you you must work really hard uh, and uh, you have wonderful talents and all the rest of it um, and um, and you know she, she sort of gets carried away and she says both of my children are unusual children uh, don't you think I know it so um, she becomes slightly hyper um, very emotional uh, and then she when she sees that <laughs> uh, Tom is also feeling upset she says promise me one thing son and he says what mother promise son you'll never be a drunkard so then she comes up with um, this idea that she has that if he stays out late at night um, he is indulging either in something criminal or he is visiting the bars and uh, drinking with his uh, companion so when she's in that emotional state she says you have to promise me one thing and that is that you will never become a drunkard and Tom says I will never be a drunkard so um, and then Amanda comes out with the idea that that is what had frightened her that is what had made her say that you know you don't go to the movies you have to tell me the truth uh, like she had done um, in the previous evening so uh, Tom says you don't need to fear that because all I drink is coffee um, and this is sort of uh, a scene of reconciliation where Amanda then offers uh, him shredded wheat biscuit and he says no 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 I just want coffee because I want to have uh, my head cleared up a bit so she, she can't um, help herself and um, the moment that um, Tom sort of uh, tries to bridge that uh, gap in their communication um, she um, puts in something else she puts in her own demands 
uh, and um, when she offers him um, some biscuits, um, he says, uh, no, I'm just going to have coffee. And then she, uh, she can't help criticizing um, her children and particularly Tom. So when he says, I, I just want coffee, she says, you know, you shouldn't drink very hot coffee on an empty stomach. It's going to make a cancer out of it um, and, and all the rest of it. And Tom still says, no, thank you, because he has um, come back uh, from uh, his night out uh, just a couple of hours back. And so he's not really in the mood to eat anything. Uh, and uh, she says, put some cream into it. And he says, no, I just want it black because he needs to have his brain cleared uh, for a day's work. Uh, and Amanda says, I know, but it's not good for you. We have to do all that we can to build ourselves up. In these trying times we live in, all that we have to cling to is each other. So she gets emotional at once. Uh, and uh, she sort of tries to um, do a bit of uh, emotional blackmail. Uh, as far as uh, Tom is concerned. And uh, then she says, you know, I've been so upset and if you hadn't spoken, I would have spoken to you, etc., etc. And Tom realizes that um, she has something on her mind. And he says, what is it that you want to discuss? And Amanda says, it's Laura. And, uh, you know, that brings to mind um, everything that has not really been said between the two of them, uh, but which has been felt. And uh, Amanda says, you know what Laura is like. Um, she's very quiet. She notices things, and I think she broods about them. Um, a few days ago, I came in, and she was crying. And uh, Amanda uh, and Tom says, why was she crying? And Amanda says she was crying about you uh, because she, um, she feels and she thinks that you're not happy here. Um, and um, Tom says, whatever gave her that idea, I have not ever said that I am not happy here. And Amanda then launches off into a long speech and she says, um, you know, um, she doesn't have to... Uh, think about anything. She sees things and she feels things. Now all these are actually Amanda's viewpoints. And in the absence of Laura, she attributes all this to Laura because she realizes that Tom is closer to Laura than he will ever be to her. So um, he, taking Laura's name, um, she uh, sort of blackmails him and uh, says, you know, she worries about you and you need to do something about yourself. So um, through Laura, she's, she's putting the gun on Laura's shoulder and firing straight at uh, Tom. Um, so, um, of course, Tom um, realizes what is wrong with Amanda. He knows the situation within the household, but there's not much that he can do about it. As far as the financial side is concerned, um, whatever he earns, he brings to his mother and um, he hands it over to her. Uh, apart from that, there's not much that um, he thinks uh, she can do. But one thing that Amanda tells him at this point in time is that she loved his father. And uh, Tom says, you know, you don't have to tell me that. I know that. And Amanda says that um, because you stay out late, I worry about you. And uh, I worry about you because your father disappeared and I don't want you to disappear because you are all that we have. So, um, the the attempts that Amanda makes to get Laura enrolled in a secretarial school um, are because she wants her to become financially independent. But when she realizes that Laura has dropped out of school and Laura has not even bothered to inform her mother, um, she realizes that there are only two things that can happen. One is that Laura must get married, 
um, so that uh, she doesn't have to worry about uh, where her next meal is coming from. And the other is that she must make sure that she keeps Tom reined in and that Tom doesn't disappear like his father um, who went away uh, many years ago and was never bothered to come back or to inquire uh, about his family. Um, so, you know, the mother and the son, they have this moment where they are able to discuss things um, and where Amanda is able to um, tell Tom um, whatever is in her mind. And so she says, you know, I, I want to know where you go at night because you spend the whole night um, outside and you come back early in the morning and then you have to go to the warehouse also. So Tom again says, I go to the movies. And when Amanda says, but why do you go to the movies so much? Um, Tom says, I go to the movies because I like adventure, because I like what they portray. Um, I'm not comfortable with, uh, with my life. Uh, and the movies uh, provide me with all sorts of entertainment and they ensure that I have something else to think about rather than the dreariness uh, and the drudgery of uh, my routine life. So this is something that uh, Amanda finds difficult to understand, the fact that uh, Tom likes adventure. And uh, what baffles her is that all her life she has tried to ensure that um, Tom will stay in the house and will not follow his father. But Tom is the kind of person who likes adventure and it's just because he likes adventure, he doesn't like the drudgery of routine life that he, um, he goes to the movies. So he goes to the movies every single night. He sees the same movies, but that is still preferable to spending the whole night at home and thinking about um, the, 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 the dollars and the cents that he is earning and how he can make them last as long as possible. So this is something that totally uh, baffles uh, Amanda. Um, and um, she, she cannot understand why a person would want to go out to the movies every single night. Now the image or the legend on the screen here is that of the Jolly Roger. And you know what the Jolly Roger is? It's that flag of um, the pirate ships where um, if you have seen movies or cartoons in which they show pirates on the seas, uh, there's always a flag um, that is flying on the ship and that is a skull and crossbones. And the skull and crossbones is supposed to be um, the insignia of uh, pirate sailing vessels. So um, that is the legend that is portrayed uh, on the screen and that is um, an image which makes it very clear to the audience that this is what is going to come next. So um, th this is the image that we see on the screen. Uh, Amanda says most young men find adventure in their careers but Tom says you know most young men don't work in warehouses and that this is something that um, sort of um, is an obsession with Tom. He can't find a better job and he doesn't like the job that he has uh, but there's not much that he can do about it. He has to make money, he has to support his family um, and so he uh, continues uh, working in uh, in the warehouse and he cannot uh, explain to his mother that his job is dull, it is boring, um, it um, there's no excitement in it and, um, and and this is again where they have a difference of opinion because um, as the way Amanda thinks uh, any man should be uh, happy because he has a job whereas um, Tom's opinion is 
that this is not much of a job. This is what he's doing because he's getting money for it. And if he had an option, if he had a choice, he would never, never work in the warehouse. We're going to stop here. I'm going to quickly recap what we have done today. Um, and um, we'll do uh, some more in the next lecture. The point at which we started uh, this class today was where uh, Amanda Wingfield and Tom have had an argument and um, Tom tries to leave the house uh, after this shouting match that he has with his mother. He tries to pull on his coat uh, but um, because all his clothes are so old and worn out, uh, the sleeve tears. When the sleeve tears, it just sort of uh, makes Tom explode and he um, takes off his coat and he throws it into the room. Now when he does that, he does it unthinkingly. And what happens is that um, his coat uh, hits the glass cabinet where Laura has placed all those glass animals where she has her glass menagerie. When the, uh, the coat hits the cabinet, there is the sound of breaking glass. And that is um, a sound that is terrible for Laura. She cries out uh, as if she is wounded. And of course, Tom at once realizes what he has done and he, um, he goes to the mantle and he tries to pick up those pieces but they are just shards of glass uh, and um, he's, he's very very upset um, to see Laura because Laura is like a broken person when, um, when she hears the sound of breaking glass and um, she uh, she doesn't know what um, to say. He doesn't know what to say. But meanwhile, Mrs. Wingfield says, I will not speak to you until you apologize. Now, that sort of makes Tom furious. And he just leaves the house. When he comes back, it is after spending the whole night uh, and it is early morning, it's about 5 o'clock when, um, when we see him walking up the alley. He um, is uh, swaying a little and he has this uh, kind of whistle thing which makes a lot of uh, noise. And when he comes to the door of the apartment, he takes the key out with a, with a little difficulty because uh, he's been drinking. Meanwhile, you see the light turning uh, on inside the house and you see Laura who is searching for Tom and she comes and sees that his bed is empty and it has not been slept in. And so she goes towards uh, the fire escape which is the entrance and she, um, she sees and she hears Tom outside. Uh, and when Tom takes out his key, it just falls into a crack in the floor and goes into the drain. So she opens up the door for him. He comes in and um, she tells him not to make noise because uh, the mother is sleeping. So he says, I want to make a lot of noise because she comes into my room every day uh, making a lot of noise and telling me to rise and shine, rise and shine. Uh, and I'm going to pay her back today. So Laura being um, the eternal peacemaker pass, tries to pacify him and says, you know, don't make a, no don't make a noise here. Mother is going to be angry, etc., etc. Um, so Tom goes off to sleep and um, before he knows it, the uh, church bell strikes six. Mrs. Wingfield wakes up and she goes um, and she tells Laura to go and wake Tom up. Uh, during this uh, time when Tom is sort of getting ready for his uh, work, uh, Mrs. Wingfield sends Laura out to get butter. And this is the time when um, Tom, after Laura has uh, pleaded with him to, um, say, to apologize to his mother, she, uh, he finally does it. There's a, so a sort of scene of reconciliation. 
uh, they discuss certain things during which uh, Amanda asks him again what, why he uh, spends the whole night outside and he tells her that um, he uh, goes to the movies she wants to know why he watches so many movies so he, he says you know I like a life of adventure uh, and this is the scene where you feel that um, the mother and the son come a little close to each other because they are at least discussing things and they're not shouting and quarreling with each other and they're not screaming at the top of their voices so this is a bit of um, a scene of reconciliation in the sense that she does listen to what he's saying uh, whether that is going to stay in her mind for a long time or not is something that still remains to be seen um, but uh, this is the point at which uh, we end the class today uh, with Amanda saying uh, young men find adventure in their careers and Tom saying this is not a career this is a job that I'm doing and I'm doing it because it's bringing in money but it's not what I want to do I want a life of adventure and I want a lot of adventure um, so uh, this at this point we leave them and uh, what becomes of their discussion we will discuss in the next class so thank you very much for being patient uh, and Allah Hafiz <laughs>